This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Maturity Investment Group is Australia's leading provider of education bonds and has over 45 years of expertise in tax and investments. The tax-effective trust-like structure of an education bond is a solution for all generations and provides unparalleled flexibility and access to deliver on-client goals ranging from paying for education costs to family wealth transfers. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm uh, pumped to be here with the original Beach Bum Advisor, uh, Mr. Darren Johnson, one and only. Darren is the founder, director and advisor at Align Financial. Uh, They've been going for almost two decades, which is, uh, you wouldn't tell from that baby face of his, but uh, uh, he's got some good longevity. Darren um, has been well recognized for all the amazing work that he does, um, including uh, being awarded the advisor of the year from the Association of Financial Advisors. Darren, thanks for joining us, buddy. Pleasure to be here, Ben, and to see your smiling face. <laughs> well, mate, I'm keen to, to get into it because, um, as I said, your business has been around for a long time and I know you've racked up a, a bunch of accolades for the amazing work that you do with your clients. I thought maybe a good place to start is just unpacking the, the story and the evolution of your, of your business and how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah, sure. So I had the the luxury of starting with a pretty clean slate in 2005. Um, I I broke away from a small advisory firm where I was and I just purchased uh, a dozen or so clients just enough to, you know, pretty much pay the rent and pay the electricity bills on day one. So I I got to design a business and I thought, well, if if I want to be a client of this or if uh, all my parents are going to be a client of my business, what would they want to get? How would I want to deliver it and how would they receive it? So I got a a really privileged to start with a clean slate that I didn't have any legacy business or anything like that. So I just built a a small advisory business, giving all the advice, guidance, care and love we could to clients and just sort of added to that over the years in terms of what we actually delivered, what we provide, how we provide it, be that in person, remotely, digitally and onboarded clients with a similar mindset. Uh, nice. And so and give far, us the big picture on on like who are you serving, what are you doing, how do you work with them, what does your team look like, client numbers? Yeah, right. So I've, I've done the courses with Bill Backrack and Jim Stackpool, John Bowen, you know, you, you, you name the courses I'm done. I'm, I'm a bit of a course junkie um, and most of them will tell you to niche, 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 niche and I, I think that's a very, very good idea. I just have just in business decided not to niche um, in any particular field or specialization. Uh, I just tend to work with people I have a a good common interest with and we have mutual respect and, and, you know, care and appreciation for each other. So that's our niche. Whether they're people who have, you know, sold a house, sold a business or started a company, it, it doesn't really matter where they come from or what they are. Right now, our metrics for a company, so there's only two staff. There's there's an ad out right now uh, for, for an, an office superstar, so that'll be three joining us shortly. Uh, we have 74 clients, so uh, on average, one and a half client meetings per week. And we onboard about five or six new clients per year. And I, I think we'll hit some kind of a soft ceiling within the next two years or so in terms of capacity to service clients. 
And what does that mean for your, because you, I think we were just chatting a bit offline that you're, you know, essentially running it in a way that sort of fits in with the lifestyle that you want. You've got a family, you know, allows you to do all of those things that you want from a, your time perspective. What, is, what does that mean in terms of your ability to take down time and work and that sort of stuff? It means that I don't ever struggle when I complete the surveys about do you spend enough time with your family and children? Do you have enough leisure time? Do you have a work-life balance? Do you need to solve any of those sorts of things? Uh, I've chosen to to build a business that um, provides outcomes and results um, but isn't necessarily dependent on me being attendance at a particular address, nine to five, five days a week, 52 weeks a year. That's probably pretty handy because every time I drive over the N- Narrabeen Bridge, I see you just stand up paddleboarding off in the in the distance. I feel like, uh, you know, it's hard to do file notes with that paddle in your hands, right? Correct. Correct. <laughs> and in, in fact, we've I've introduced it something lately, whereas if I, I meet with um, product providers or BDNs, BDMs or, or someone who's likely to want to sell me something, we do walking meetings around the lake. So we don't just come in and sit down. We go for a walk around the lake. You've got 35 minutes because that's how long it takes one way to the beach and back. Um, nice. We talk and we walk. So it's a good recommend way. it to anyone. Good yeah. Good way to keep the steps up. Yeah, correct. Um, what were the biggest challenges when you kicked off uh, in the early days and you're looking to to sort of start out with your solution? I think it was knowing and being told and having done the courses to be selective. But when you're looking at your bank account each week or each month and you've got staff to pay and knowing that there is just a lot of other potential work out there but doesn't fit your ideal client profile, just trying to keep true to that. Um, and balancing the fact that no, the results will come, the the ideal clients will come, um, and just trying to keep focus on just onboarding clients that you know are a good fit with our business and that we can actually serve and add value to them, as opposed to just taking income in those early years and just saying okay, let's just you know let's let's sell one event anything to everyone if we can. Mm. And I don't think yeah. that's changed a lot today, Ben. I, I think people still experience that, you know, 15, yeah. 16 years later in business today. It's, yeah, it is still hard. It's always hard to to say no. And I have found in, in my business that in the earlier days, I, especially when I was the one I was doing the sales, I was doing the delivery, I was doing the advice. And plus, I just, obviously, I want to grow my business and I would like to make money. Um, and I love helping people as well that it's like you see someone in there, they're like way outside of what you typically work with, but you can see that there is a real need for help, see that there's a commercial opportunity there and you want to help someone. And while that it can all be true, I found that those ones, they end up just consuming so much time and, and working outside of that, that you just end up regretting it. And even now, and I'm having this conversation with our our um our sales manager our relationship manager that she obviously she wants to get her deals and 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 hit her numbers but when you've got a client where what the sort of help that they want even just doesn't quite a hundred percent match with what you want in like that they've got something that's really particular need or um philosophy or you know thinking process around a particular aspect of their money so if it's not lining up we've i've learned that we have to say like this no it's better to speak to somebody else find that alignment then you'll be a good client for them you get a better outcome because when you when you do that it's like you can still deliver but you end up spending five times as long because it's like you've got to then go back and go back and um yeah just just uh you end up regretting it and I think in a level as much as you can do things to get to a point where people walk away happy it's just not worth it on both sides in terms of the inputs that you need it is but you did touch on one interesting point there which a lot of advisors I know have is that they actually genuinely want to help people and so if you're taking a phone call from a you know a new prospect and they said look I've asked this person I've asked this person nobody seems to be able to you know help me with this particular issue or this challenge I'm facing can you help and they describe it to you and you're like do you know what I I probably can help you there it's difficult mm. when you've got that bit inside you that just wants to help people and mm. you just know they won't get the advice that they need anywhere else but then how do you dispatch that in a you know in a fair and profitable and equitable way it, it's difficult when you you want you want is to actually help people it's difficult yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. And what do you, what, you know, you guys have been in business a bit over 17 years. What have been the biggest shifts? Like what's, what's changed the most? I know that you said, you said the market's sort of similar and you've just been following that steady um, pace of growth, but what have been the biggest shifts? Well, from an advisory point of view, I think when I got my first letter of authority, um, the director of the dealer group just uh, did a background reference check and wrote me a letter and said, hi, Darren, you're now authorised to give advice. That was about the extent of it. Um, now, you know, the advisors have to do degree qualified. They're required to do their PY. There's a whole lot more which goes on up front, which I think is fantastic for us as a profession mm. because it means that all new entrants and all our peers are, um, you know, really, really well qualified day one. They might not have the interpersonal skills uh, yet, but they, they certainly have the, you know, the, the, the written and the educational piece down pat, which is fantastic. But in terms of what maybe hasn't changed, if I could answer it that way, People mm. still need advice. People are still just looking for somebody, you know, to say, can I do this? How much do I need to save? Am I making silly mistakes? Do I have enough? The, the questions that people are asking you know, on the street have not changed in the 20 years I've been doing this, despite the fact that all the products, bells and whistles, all the, you know, the, the tools and the little things we use might have tra- might have changed. But the thing that, you know, the underlying question that people are asking in the street, our clients that we help, I don't think it's changed at all. Mm. Yeah, it's funny that I think that um, we are probably pushed more along that curve, though, in terms of those conversations in that historically, like, advisors would be there and a lot of advisors built great businesses around providing specific, you know, product, basically product-related advice and product-related services and investment management advice and services. But I think as technology has meant that there's more offerings in that space that people can access at a lower cost at a, you know, potentially with a slicker user experience, it's maybe more on demand. It's meant that that people that advise clients and consumers, and we were just chatting a bit offline about the increasing cost of advice and the inputs and all those things that, people are really that they, they need those higher level questions answered and you because that was your just philosophy and approach that you were focused on answering those from the start but i think that 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 really is the future that as we see going to see less and less advisors that are involved in the product side of advice still involved because it's linked but um where the true value is in the product and technical and the more value is in the support the confidence the peace of mind Correct, well. correct, correct. And the, the big movement on that in the US, uh, you know, is what they call financial life planning or life planning. Mm. It's, it's a fantastic world. Um, there's a little bit of it over here, but in the US they have this, you know, great breadth of knowledge on this concept of financial life planning where they don't quite get people on a couch. You know, we're not therapists mm. yet or not counsellors. But they really, really try deeply and hardly to, to get people to, you know, understand and relate uh, and link their money to their, to, you know, to their values and their lives. Mm, they still give I advice on the products and the bits and pieces, but, but they, they just try and, you know, make it a whole lot richer experience. And it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great world of, of, of knowledge and, and people out there. Um, if you're interested in that sort of stuff. And I'm very excited for the day where I could just put all the technical and producty stuff into a little computer machine and then have that spit out the other end and focus on the, the client and the the values and those conversations, the confidence and the, you know, bigger picture decision making. I think that that is really where the true value of having a human as opposed to um, a solution sort of fits f- with this process. So um, as much as the machines are obviously smarter than uh, me and almost as smart as you. Um, the, I think that you know that the, what they can't do is when people are making million dollar decisions, give them that that same level of peace of mind that you can from just looking someone in the eyes. Correct. So it's like, I'm excited for that. Correct. Darren, I, I, tell us about the advisor of the year process and sort of how you ended up on that path, what some of the things were that they focused on, and how that all came together. So I'd looked at knocking our little business into shape um, to, to try and compete in an award or, or, or just have our processes and, and what we do kind of vetted. And I spoke to a, a, a mate of mine, an advisor mate, David Reed, 
who'd actually won the award the year before I did. And he said, look, what do you think? And I said, I'm thinking about entering it, you know, maybe in 12 months time. He goes, perfect. You're ready. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're never ready. He said, no one ever has an empty inbox, has all their tasks <laughs> checked off, has all of their filing done and has everything in business exactly where you want it. And if you reckon you're within 12 months of that, he said, enter it right now. So I, I did, and it's, it was a really, really good process going through the process. The fact we won was a massive bonus um, and a terrific honour and thrill and something I'm still, you know, I get tingles about when I think about it still. Um, but going through the process was terrific for our business, for our staff and our clients. And so what I mean by that is you get all of your – what you actually, the meat in your sandwich, you know, your financial advice sandwich, what you deliver to a client, you get looked at by outside people. Um, and they're comparing your sandwich or your burger or what you're offering with tens or potentially hundreds of other ad advisors across the country that they've seen. So mm. you get a good bit of feedback on whether they think, you know, there's relative value in the financial advice you're providing. Mm. You then go along the step a little bit and then they say, okay, that's what you say you're doing can we survey your clients and can we see if they actually think that, you know, what you say you're doing, they're actually getting value out of the other end. So, so you, get, you get a terrific survey conducted on your clients um, by a third party. Interesting. And how do your clients find that? Like were they open to spending the time? Because obviously there's a bit of time involved at, at their end to participate. Correct. So an interesting offshoot of that is the two clients that we had at the time that had a bit of resistance and reluctance both left us within 18 months. Is that right? So I'm not saying that it was a predictor or a forecast, but mm. the, the, the two the two clients who pretty much declined to provide feedback um, to, to participate in the survey of, of you know the client satisfaction survey, both mm. moved on for different reasons within 18 months. Interesting. So that was kind of an interesting little little side side chat. Some of the other feedback, um, you know, a lot of it's glowing and then a lot of it's like, oh, okay, righto. I asked for it. You gave it to me. Um, and then I think the worst thing you can do there is nothing about it. Yeah. So if somebody gives you a bit of feedback that says, look, in this area, or, or we don't quite understand this, or, or they've always talked about this thing, we never know what he's talking about or something like that, is if yeah. it goes unaddressed. So we then had the task of going through and saying, okay, well, let's, Let's address all of these areas um, mm. as best we can. So that was great because then you get to tailor your service delivery to your clients. Mm. And what were the big things that, well, the, obviously you were doing a fantastic job, which is why you won the award in the first place. But like, were there any significant changes that came off the back in terms of how you work with your clients, how you engage with them, how you deliver information to them like, from those insights? Um, th there was a little bit of how we reported to clients which changed. So, so we, we'd been, um, it's not quite the case, but say we'd been sending in a, you know, you, know, you were a balance sheet um, in an Excel spreadsheet with a bar chart for, for the past six years and saying, okay, Ben and Ben's family, here's your, here's your financial progress over the past six years. And we got some feedback from a client that said they could never understand what was going on. And pretty much all I did was change that bar chart to a pie chart and resent it. Darren, this is the most fantastic thing. Oh, I can't believe the progress <laughs> we made. And, and honestly, it was almost that simple, the change we made. But because we were able to hear from the client that they weren't quite getting what we were sending them, even though to me it was plain what – they then got the value of the advice we're providing and they thought, oh, this is fantastic. I can't believe this. Well, there you go. It just goes to show that you never know what are the things that we just take for granted that you, you know, think make sense, that um, little yeah, things that people just don't gel with and you, you can be guaranteed that if one person is missing it, then there's a bunch of others that are as well. Absolutely. So the difference mm. between the message given and the message received, there's you know, sometimes a, a, a massive gap in between. Yeah, and what happened after, so you, you went through the process, won the award, did, you know, did anything else, like it, did it move the dial in terms of engagement with your clients or new clients or what did you, you know, post the, post the actual award itself? So I, I think... Clients felt a sense of validation um, and some comfort knowing that the advisor they'd chosen to work with um, has been 
tested against peers and, and came out, you know, on, on top, which was a nice thing for them. And then you don't, and I spoke to other advisors who've who've done been through a similar process. You you don't get sixty referrals the month after, but what you do get is the client gets a much easier conversation to perhaps refer their clients or as friends or introduce their friends. Mm. So whereas before the the uh, um, winning the award, you know our clients might have said to their friends, "Oh yeah, I've got this advisor, Darren. Um, he, he's a good guy, and they look after us really well. Provide us great advice." They say the same thing after we won the award. They get to say, yeah, we, we've got this advisor, Darren. He's a good guy, provides great advice. Oh, and he's the Australian Advisor of the Year. So just that little hmm. bookend to that introduction just helps, you know. It goes a long that, way for the kudos. Correct, and credit. First, correct, correct, with that first step. So then, you know, we, we did find and still find that the phone rings more often because you, you do have a little bit of peer validation of of you know, your, your business and what you do. Yeah, interestingly, and I've spoken to a few other award winners um, as well and, and some of the feedback that I've got from them is around that when they have that sort of external validation of what they're doing, it also gives them more confidence in their solution, which means that they're even more because I think sometimes you subconsciously like um, – you know, benefit from having that where where people go, oh, yeah, I've thrown down with the best and, you know, we came out on top to then go and push for people um, to, to say what sets you apart. Do you, would you say that's um, uh, something that you've experienced? Yeah, and it just also gives you a, 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 the confidence that, okay, what we are doing, because we all, most of us, right, advisors, most of us just build our little cottage industry in, a, in our little offices independently of one another and there's there's very I mean there's strict guidelines in terms of what has to be in a statement of advice but there's very loose guidance as to what actually constitutes a financial planning advice relationship and what do you have to do for a client over the course of a year so we're all mm. building these different things and delivering different things and it's it's, it does give you good confidence and comfort to know that what you're actually doing, so how you've built your sandwich and how you dispatch it, um, has been looked at and, you know, other people, third parties, external consultants, um, p people looking, you know, to, to critique your business think actually what you're doing is, is pretty good and reasonable. So that's, you know, it then gives you confidence to have the next conversation with the next prospect to say, here's the advice we give, here's what we do, here's what our fees, um, here's where you can find us. That's it, yeah. And I think that having, again, like for, for standing up on the fees and especially in an environment where our fees are, you know, increasing in line with all the requirements on the business and our compliance, resourcing, and licensing, PI and all of those sorts of things, uh, you know, you, you need to have good confidence um, uh, be behind that uh, for sure. Darren, if you could go back to your, um, you know, yourself on day one of, of kicking off your business, what do you think, what would you do differently? I'd go into a niche. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I think. Which one? I don't know. It, it could be knee surgeons. It, it could be, you know, EHP executives working out of Newcastle. I, I don't know, but I, I think I'd find a, a deep and narrow niche and go into it and just spend time in there. Hmm. And why do you say that? Because you said at the start that you, you obviously you didn't do that and, and then your business has obviously kicked a whole bunch of goals along the way. So what's driving that? Because if I remember your question correctly, you said if I could go back and do it again, I've done it this way once already, not that I'm finished, but I've done it one way, um, just working with people I really enjoy and people I like being not niche specific at all. Mm. That is terrific, I think, from a client relationship point of view. It's not terrific, terrific from a business efficiency and operational point of view. Whereas if we dealt with a specific set of people who had similar circumstances, similar situations and similar challenges, our business could be a lot more streamlined mm. um, and, and possibly scalable because you're dispatching the Big Mac in a similar order, in a, in a similar fashion to people with similar, you know, dietary requirements or similar financial needs as, as opposed to, you know, looking after a broad spectrum of people who might 
be at one end of starting a business, another end of starting a business or selling a business or inheriting or, or plant. I just think from a business operational point of view, I'd like to have a go at doing it the other way around. Mm. Look, I find we, like I mentioned before, that we've got a, a reasonably tight sort of two niches that we work in, which is tech professionals and then um, successful SME business owners and operators. And yeah. what I've found that there there is a benefit in your marketing, like marketing to that niche that you can talk to their problems. But I would say just as beneficial is the ability to then um, have everyone running on the same processes behind the scenes because all of the clients sort of look and feel the same dietary requirements as you, as you put it. Um, I think I'll have to borrow that one. Um, but it allows us to then when we're training team, and especially we've got a reasonable offshore team as well with people that aren't necessarily deeply experienced in financial services, that we know that everyone's following the same process everyone's obviously their unique snowflake and their advice ends up being different but the process and steps and requirements are all the same so for training onboarding managing it's um it does give uh, a lot of um yeah benefits on that side it's give it it's give and take in because you do lose a little bit of the you know custom sort of bespoke feel to it to a process but um yeah i've found that from a, a because we are hiring and training a lot of people that it is um yeah really helpful on that you're side. right and what you speak about too about the message your message speaks to a certain people a certain a certain area of the market i mean seth godin says that you know 99 percent of people won't ever hear anything about your business and that's plenty of people <laughs> So 99% of Australians probably, you know, you might be different, Ben, because you've got a very high media profile, but for the rest <laughs> of us, 99% of, of Australians won't know anything about Align Financial or me or, or whoever other advisors there are, and that's plenty. Mm. The 1% well, is plenty. 1% is more than enough for me. So Correct. Uh, Correct. <laughs> I think, think you hit the nail on the head. But Darren, mate, thank you so much for sharing your insights. I really appreciate it. For you mentioned that you're currently hiring. For anyone that's that's keen to learn more about the opportunity, what's the best way for them to find out? Jump on our Facebook page, so Align Financial uh, on the Facebook, and uh, have a rummage around and get in touch with me, the big dog. And if you are keen for a bright and sunny board short career on Narrabeen's northern beaches get in touch nice one mate all right well uh get around it guys i can uh, speak to the lifestyle aspect of that walking meetings you know he's, he's got it all over there so uh mate thank you really appreciate again sharing your insights been great thanks ben see you mate